London news agents. Last night, one of the few Republican candidates left in the race to be president pulled out of a race he was always going to lose. Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey, now throws the race a little bit more open than it has been. But he went out throwing down the gauntlet to the candidates left to take on Trump. Anyone who is unwilling to say that he is unfit to be president of the United States is unfit themselves to be president of the United States. The argument has always been you just need one person left in the race to tackle Trump. Well, we're now down to two, essentially. Does it mean that Donald Trump is invincible still? Or is there a chink in the armour whereby he could actually be defeated for the Republican nomination? Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And until now, the kind of received wisdom in the US is that, frankly, Donald Trump needs to fall down the steps of Trump one uh, and kind of do himself serious damage for there to be any possibility it's going to be someone other than Donald Trump representing the Republican Party in the 2024 election in November. That's still probably, probably what needs to happen for Donald Trump to exit the race. But there does seem to be a little bit of an opening now where you could imagine Donald Trump getting a reverse in maybe New Hampshire in 10 days time and suddenly the race opening up. And there was a flurry of activity last night around 11 o'clock our time when Chris Christie, who's one of the few candidates who's been left in the Republican race to actually try and call out Trump, suddenly announced that he was going to quit the stage. And this came just hours before an Iowa debate hosted by CNN, which would see Nikki Haley go head to head with Ron DeSantis. Donald Trump obviously qualified, but chose to be elsewhere. In fact, he was with his Fox counterparts doing a sit down interview with them. The question is, as Christie exits the stage, will there just be a ripple? that is immediately covered over by whatever Donald Trump says and does and manages to persuade people of now? Or has he actually left a sizable hole in his own supporters, which could then help Nikki Haley secure at least one of the races in this early part of the election, the New Hampshire primary, which will happen in two weeks' time? And we should say the reason why the stars might just be aligning on this, right, is because you know, primary process in particular are all about momentum and it's all about timing it right and it's about winning the right race. And it has been true. I mean, we're, what, days away now from the Iowa caucuses, the first uh, nomination process. Um, Trump is clearly going to win that. He's way out ahead in the polls. New Hampshire is not far away. And it is true to say that Haley, the former UN ambassador, someone who served in the Trump administration, former governor of South Carolina, she has been gaining on Trump. You know, she has been slowly but surely. People have been saying she's timed it exactly right. The momentum is coming her way. And if, 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 if she could beat him there, even if it's by one percentage point, it would, you talk about the chink in the armour, John, it would expose the fundamental Trump argument, which is to say only he is going to win this, that no one else is going to come close. And if he can lose there, then maybe, just maybe, she can use that momentum, go to South Carolina, from where she hails, and go to the other Super Tuesday in March, and maybe actually it's a race. So today you've got Donald Trump in court in New York. Not that he has to be there. It's a civil case and it's uh, closing arguments in that case. Um, He's doing it because actually courts are a campaign place for him. It's the stump for him and he can use it uh, to raise money. And Donald Trump keeps going on to Truth Social, his social media platform, to say Biden is trying to frame me. Biden is so terrified that he has to do this to push me out of the race. That's bullshit. The person that Biden is most frightened of is Nikki Haley. Mm. Nikki Haley represents the real threat. And if Republicans start asking themselves the question, not do we have to have Donald Trump, but who do Democrats fear the most, then actually you could see that if Nikki Haley did well in New Hampshire, there would be a massive momentum shift. And 
in the Democratic Party, there would be serious alarm because yeah. Nikki Haley, young, articulate, able, been a UN ambassador, all the rest of it, former governor. I don't know how Biden on earth would fight her. Yeah, I mean, I think before our listeners start thinking we've taken, you know, the laughing gas on this one, we should just point out... We did take the laughing gas we did we take that. We are playing a pinball machine game here, which is that you have to get so many things yeah. in the right order. Stars so many, have to align. They have to align so tightly yeah. for it not to be Donald Trump. I think we kind of have to stand back and say it is highly unlikely, as things stand, Agreed. that it wouldn't be Donald yeah. Trump. But I think it's also interesting that Christie now has to decide where his support goes. And clearly the two candidates left, Haley, DeSantis, are both vying to attract the support of Chris Christie's small but, you know, loyal following of supporters. Now, Christie hoped that he would exit the stage with this rather thoughtful, statesmanlike call to arms. We need somebody who can call out President Trump. And he went on to say, Donald Trump is angry every single day because he wants you to be angry every single day. And it did all sound remarkably serious and sort of full of integrity until the bit where he was caught off mic, managing to slag off both candidates left in the race. We'll just play you that moment. She spent 68 million so far, just on TV. Spent 68 million so far. 59 million by DeSantis, and we spent 12. I mean, who's punching above their weight and who's getting a return on their investment, you know? And she's going to get smoked. And you and I both know it. She's not up to this. She hasn't even she's still 20 points behind Trump in New Hampshire, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And he's, gonna, he's still going to carry Iowa, right? Yes. Oh, he's, I, t- you know, I talked to De- DeSantis, called me, petrified so that I would. He's probably getting out petrified i mean we could i think we can finish the sentence petrified that him chris christie is going to endorse nikki haley i mean i would bet both of you a double cheeseburger with extra fries and cucumbers on the side that cucumbers it, yeah dill cucumber you always get okay. a nice bit of you know pickle cucumber oh, in, okay in, in the right? bets that you do with John Zabon. Yeah, 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 of course. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Always, always, the dill always. cucumber. Okay, I don't the, think I've the, got any of those, but the, okay, I can probably Christy source will them. will endorse uh, Nikki Haley. Yeah. I'm absolutely convinced of it. There is no way he's going to back uh, DeSantis. And the people around uh, Chris Christie, who he's close to, uh, are already kind of making admiring glances. So if he does endorse, it will be Nikki Haley. But I mean, what else can you do? Christie, I mean, just in case people obviously have been following the, the sort of long sort of durée of the process so far. Like Christie has been, by far and away, as we've said, the most explicit uh, explicit attacker of Trump. The guy who has put most explicitly the kind of what you might call the old party establishment Republican critique of Trump, which is that, you know, I mean, it's not a difficult critique to make. The guy has literally been indicted scores and scores of times. He's unfit to be president, as you both said at the top. He's the guy who has said explicitly, the only one who said that he's unfit to be president. Um... And so the argument was going to be, we talked about it, I think, just before Christmas, John, or maybe just after, that the if he had stayed in the race and he had still got 10 points or 12 points and she had lost by two or three points, he would have enabled precisely the thing that he was saying that he least wanted, which was a Trump restoration. And there is, I mean, parts of the Republican Party are, are still haunted by the fact that, you know, back in 16, Rubio and Cruz never came to a deal, a, a deal that Cruz thought that he could secure and at that moment take Trump out. And it never happened because Rubio didn't want to do it. And we know what happened. The, we know what happened next. The rest is history. We're going to play you some of the clips from the actual debate that went on between Haley and DeSantis in a moment. And they were at each other's throats like a newly divorcing couple. It was really unsalubrious, actually, just to listen to, because you got very little sense of anything except how much they didn't trust what the other one was saying. But in a way, and I think this is kind of critical to the whole conversation we're having, none of this may matter. And I was listening to... Iowa voters afterwards, after the debate had finished and their response to it. What time in the morning was that? OK, so no, I was listening to it this morning, which was kind of, you Don't know, lie. much later. No, no, proper this morning. Okay. I mean, I was up for a little bit in the night and I was kind of crossing between Trump and... The, anyway, that just makes me sound she sad. So I'm not she doesn't go. sleep. She no. CNN on one screen, NBC on the other. But the best 
line I heard was from a, a US commentator who said it's like the couple that goes into the diner for their Sunday lunch every single week and they order their meatloaf. And one day there's a new server and the new survey says, hey, would you like to hear the specials? And the couple go, yeah, why not? We'll hear your specials. And they let the server take them through all the specials. And then at the end they go, I think we'll have the meatloaf, right? And that is Trump. Trump is still going to be the meatloaf for most people in this race in Iowa right now and probably in New Hampshire. He's still going to be the meatloaf. So we're kind of listening to noise and we're listening to debate and we're listening to policy on abortion and Ukraine and spending and debt, which may never, ever matter. But the other thing about the Trump campaign and, you know, it's been clever. Trump has stayed out of these debates. He's risen above it. Now, he would have probably quite enjoyed it. But he know, he knew full well that if he was on a dis- debate stage with Christie and Haley, it would all be a, a piling against Trump. So Trump is a master at getting the attention of the American public. So he does his own thing. He's being in court today. That will upstage all the people that are campaigning in Iowa. Um, he was in court in Washington earlier in the week. He did his separate. He did his separate interview with Fox News, and Donald Trump just makes sure that he, he's almost above all the noise. He's fighting and the general election. He's fighting the general election, and you've got Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis going. Nah, 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 nah. How uh, are they going? Just do yeah. it once more. Just We're going to play nah, you nah, a little. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> It goes back to that young kid in the town hall that she had where he said, Nikki Haley, you are the new John Kerry. You're for it before you are against it. It's a shame that we had to put up DeSantisLies.com. Honestly, if he would spend as much time trying to prove why he thinks he would be a good president, he would be doing a lot better in the polls. The reason that he spent and blown through $150 million and gone down in the polls is because he spent more time trying to lie about me than he is about telling the truth about himself. Every time he lies, Drake University, don't turn this into a drinking game because you will be overserved by the end of the night. I love that word overserved. It's got so much sort of US puritanism to it, right? <laughs> not not sh- based, but just overserved, <laughs> right? So yeah, so so essentially, I mean that was her one dare I say that was her one slightly funny line because she's speaking to a university audience and she's basically saying his campaign has been badly run, he lies about the things he makes up and don't trust him, right? And if you think about it, she is fighting him, right? Which is kind of all wrong in the first place because they're both really fighting Trump and they should be fighting Biden. So they're so far behind in the race. It's like watching... Well, it's like the game at the World Cup where you're playing for third and fourth place and you think, oh God, no one gives a shit. Yeah, this I might just switch match. over at this point. I'm going to switch off at this point. And you have Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. It's the going to a boxing kind of fight and you've got the, the bout at the top of the bill. And this is one of the b- low But to card. your point, what she says on Ukraine or abortion or NATO or yeah. anything else becomes important if she seals the deal on that vote, that contest in New Hampshire in two weeks' time. Totally. And then suddenly everyone's going to be going, oh, what was she saying again? I mean, this has been the most weird Republican or any presidential primary contest that in, in modern US history. Yes. There has been this weird shadow campaign going on at the same time that Trump is not even there. I mean, the very fact that Trump has felt able to just bypass all of that is a sign of his not only complete confidence and a uh, adversion to his takeover of the Republican Party. And when I listened to the Christie call, I actually, what I really heard actually more than anything else was complete despair. You know, yes, okay, he was sort of having a go at Haley, but there was another element to it as well, which is kind of like, she spent all this money, DeSantis spent all this money, we've spent money, and we're still absolutely nowhere. It was actually a kind of recognition of this guy's continued, despite everything, everything, the indictments and everything else, his complete dominance over his party that he has spent his entire life in. And indeed, he was once Trump's friend himself. Yeah, I mean, I'd also say that Chris Christie, you know, despite the name, is not actually the salvation of the Republican Party, right? He could have been so much tougher, so much quicker, so much more forceful in many of the debates where he should have called out Trump much harder than he did. I think that is a failure of Chris Christie because he had one job, as we say, right? Mm. His one job was to expose Trump for the liar, the mendacious kind of charlatan that he is. But he did do it more than anyone else. A bit more. But also people have memories. I mean, for God's sake, you know, when Chris Christie pulled out of New Hampshire last time on Super Tuesday, 
Chris Christie is appearing alongside yeah. Donald Trump at Mar-a-Lago. I was there in the audience and it was like, you know, Chris Christie should have been dressed in a very large orange jumpsuit. Well, he wanted to be his attorney general, didn't he? Yeah, that exactly. He wanted a big time. job. Yeah, yeah. And Christie was sucking up to Trump you, at that stage. You know what the best thing that Trump does? He does public viewing compromat. He takes pictures of people at his side and then he makes them public. Whether it's Chris Christie, who then fell on his sword because he was exposed quite early on. Whether it was Mitt Romney, who I actually think we think of as being one of the few kind of senior US Republicans to have stood up to Donald Trump. But Romney wanted a job from Trump not so long ago. Whether it was Kevin McCarthy, who had a two week period in which he was so incensed with Trump's behaviour after January the 6th that he decided he was going to bring about a censure or support impeachment or help the Democrats and suddenly that all turned around and he appears in that photo with Donald Trump. Donald Trump's genius is getting these people at their hypocritical worst and going, they like me then. Well, he lowers everyone to his level. And the fact that he's shameless means that, in a sense, he still rises above them. He's lowered got them. Got yeah, yeah, exactly. But I suppose we should say that if, if the star, you know, you talk about the stars aligning really closely, I mean, it, it is still unlikely. But if it were to be the case that she were to eke out a win in New Hampshire, I mean, Christie was right about one thing. And he said at the end, the future of this country is going to be determined here, referring to New Hampshire. If Donald yeah. Trump wins here, he will be our nominee. Everything that happens after that is going to be on our party and our country. It's up to you. Absolutely. It is true to say that voters, the Republican primary voters in New Hampshire, they do have a choice. They can either basically seal the deal, Trump will be the nominee, and all of the constitutional chaos that could be coming as a result, or he's still likely to be the nominee, but there is a chance that it doesn't happen. And my word, I mean, you know, Haley, I mean, she's clearly on the, the, the right in all sorts of different ways, but she is a far more traditional Republican figure in every single way. The, the, the relief in the chancellors of Europe, in Kiev and everywhere else. Never forget Biden. And the Biden. panic in the Democratic Party. And the panic frankly, in the Democratic yeah, Party because she would probably wipe the floor with yeah. Biden because in November. She, because she is a constitutionalist. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say a word about money. Uh, and the just, you know, you, we were talking about uh, the fact that Ron DeSantis has so far spent $150 million on his campaign to get a nomination to run for the election. I mean, that is more than twice the combined total that Labour and Conservatives spent at the last general election in the UK. And what's he got for UK. it? And what's he I got mean, to the, show the for it? the sums of money that are going up in smoke, uh, buying TV spots and all the rest of it, it's just as, I mean, I know well, that's... that the UK, US has five times the population of the UK. But my God, it spends about a million times the money. I mean, on that elections. was a, that was a criticism Haley levelled at him was that he wasn't even spending it on ad campaigns in yeah. Iowa. He was spending it on his private, private jet. jet. He's talking about where's this money going to come from? You, the best way to tell about a candidate is to see how they've run a, their campaign. He has blown through a hundred and fifty million dollars. I don't even know how you do that. Through his campaign, he has nothing to show for it. He spent more money on private planes than he has on commercials trying to get Iowans to vote for him. If you can't manage a campaign, how are you going to manage a country? Which is exactly... I mean, Rishi's looking like, you know, he's got a two-pound <laughs> bus fare right yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I guess the question on that, and I keep, I keep going back to it in my head, because I was listening to a lot of the debate and just thinking, genuinely, they can't be the two best people that America has to offer the Republican voter. They cannot, or even the three best people if you want to pull Trump into it. Does the money thing just massively skew the electoral system away from getting the right people? Wow, that is such a wide question about are we getting the best people into politics? But I mean, now? yeah, and you can ask, you, you know, that you could ask that about Britain as well. And not just but Britain. not on money, not on money in that yeah. same yes. way, right? Anyone can stand to be an MP and you could argue that, you know, the way that the Conservatives won the Red Wall was not well, again, money, it huge, was, yeah. Although it is a really expensive standard MP. I mean, it's actually like, it ended up costing the average candidate about 70 grand. I mean, not, yeah, small, small figures by comparison to the US, but, Peanuts. you know, like, yeah, well, but not if you're, you know, not, if, not if you're giving up a job yeah, to do exactly. It. But just on the US thing, I mean, you can ask the even bigger question, right, which is not just a Republican primary, but that's the question that clearly, yeah, hundreds of millions of American voters are asking themselves about Trump yeah, and Biden. 70 percent. That they cannot believe yeah. that they're going to be faced with the same two people as they were for the first time since the 1950s, last time this happened was in the 1950s, you have the same two candidates from election after election, and they can't believe that it would be these two, you know, one's an octogenarian, one's nearly an octogenarian, and both are deeply unpopular. Something has gone wrong in the structures of American democracy that that would nonetheless be the result. Completely. It is an absolute, you know, 
who do you mind the least? Yeah. Who is the least worst option? There is no sense of hope, enthusiasm, or anything. Well, if the election turns, if the election does. turns out to be Trump versus Biden. 2.0. My God, what a dismal choice for the American people. We talked about Trump skipping the debate. He went off to do an interview um, with Fox's Brett Baer and he touched a couple of nerves there. One was joking about having Chris Christie for his vice president. That won't happen. Eight years ago, you know, people were asking it much more seriously. He also had something to say about COVID, NATO. You have a listen. I think it was done out of incompetence. That's what I think. I believe that a scientist went out, said hello to his girlfriend, and that was the end of that. She died, and then people started dying all over the place. But who knows? Who knows? I can tell you one thing. I got along with President Xi. Sir, what a second Trump term would mean. Would you be committed to NATO, for example, in a second Trump term? Depends if they treat us properly. Look, NATO has taken advantage of our country. The European countries took advantage of, uh, I want to use the word starting with an S, but I don't want to do it because I see some young very good looking children in the audience and I assume they're watching on television, but they took advantage of us on trade and then they took advantage of us on our military protection of the 28 countries at the time. Should we talk about NATO or young, very good looking children? I, I, <laughs> young, very good looking children. <laughs> so look, on NATO, Trump couldn't sound more hostile to it and he is hostile to it. And at the first NATO meeting that he went to, um, he wanted to pull the US out of NATO and was told you just can't and was prevailed upon uh, to do that. Um, it must be music to Vladimir Putin's ears every time Donald Trump opens his mouth and opines on the Western alliance that has been, you know, kept the peace in Europe ever since the Second World War. And Donald Trump is temperamentally antipathetic to it. And we've said it before, but you know what? If Trump gets back, and all hell breaks loose, and who knows what happens to the West and Putin. There will be lots of inflection points, but one of the most ironic of all, and the guilty men, will be Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans for not in convicting him in the uh, trial in the Senate after January the 6th. And why is that particularly ironic? Because who is the most, actually one of the biggest figures and the person who is often on the Republican side most eloquently arguing to his colleagues in Congress that the US needs to continue to support Ukraine, it's Mitch, Mitch McConnell. McConnell. Yeah. And he's going to be the guy who not, <laughs> not just dug his own pol political party's grave, but potentially dug the grave of Ukraine itself. So I think before we leave this, we should just kind of take our listeners, viewers, through the kind of calendar dates that we're looking out for now. Because Iowa is next Monday night. Yeah. So we'll have the results of that on Tuesday. You would not expect anyone other than Trump to lead the way in Iowa. He will dominate there. And then we will all turn our focus to New Hampshire, Hampshire which, which is, is really week. is the following week. And it's really the only missing bit of the jigsaw at the moment in the Republican race. I'm not quite sure the new, we're just getting the results in from the New Hampshire primary. Actually. Is that how long we've been <laughs> <Yeah>. talking? <laughs> oh, it just passed in a flash. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Well, Emily might have been up all night listening to the CNN debate and then listening to the analysis afterwards. And, you know, I was sleeping, I've got to say. Um, no. Yeah. Oh, I find that hard to believe. But the schmoozing, morning, I think. Schmoozing. Yes. No, he yeah. does his schmoozing before midnight. Yeah. Uh, but I was gripped this morning by the post office inquiry, needless to say, that everyone has ignored until now. So and no, one, no one had ever said that before. No, but, exactly. Yeah. And there was a guy called Stephen Bradshaw uh, appearing before the inquiry who was the post office investigator who d kind of went after a number of the sub post masters and mistresses uh, and kind of brought about prosecutions. And it was like going back to kind of life on Mars with some of the things that he had said. You know, you're telling me a pack of lies and why don't you get up earlier the in the morning? TV series, not the Bowie not song. The, yeah, <laughs> exactly. TV series, not the Bowie song. Um, and it was kind of, oh, my God. Now, Stephen Bradshaw, I, I, if you're going to look at social media tonight, I probably wouldn't because it's not going to be very flattering to you. You know, it, it, it seemed to me watching it that it was a sort of remorse free zone. Uh, and he still works for the post office. He's been post office man and boy 45 years and has became an investigator. But of course, he was just doing his job. He was just the hired killer sent out by the post office to kind of do the prosecutions. 
He wasn't the one making the decisions. He wasn't the one that was fully in the know about the faults in the Horizon IT system. And, and I kind of think that you're going to end up getting the wrong people in the crosshairs of all of this, that it will be the people lower down the food chain, whereas the people at the top, at the, still at the moment, kind of protected from it. There's another element to this story as well, which is there is some concern about the precedent that Rishi Sunak said that he and the government would basically create yesterday when Sunak said, and I think he had he had no choice and there was probably no other way around it, but he said that the government would introduce primary legislation to exonerate, to expunge the criminal prosecutions that are taking convictions, place with regard yeah. and the convictions with regards to this. And, of course, that will be so welcome to so many of the people uh, involved. And as I say, I don't think there was any other choice at this stage. There will be a lot of lawyers and there are people who are worried about it in one regard, which is that it is highly unusual, in fact, pretty much without precedent in modern history anyway, for Parliament to come along and say, we are going to overturn these convictions that have taken place in courts of law because MPs say so, because Parliament says so. We don't have formal separation of powers like they do in the US, but it is part of our unwritten constitution that, that is something that Parliament just doesn't do, that that is a matter for courts. Parliament can pardon something and pardon convictions that have taken place, but they don't expunge it. They don't say that basically this never happened in the first place. And actually, when I mean, you can have an argument, and, and there are lawyers who are worried about the precedent that sets, so that could happen in the future. One of the reasons, though, that it's kind of had to happen, which tells you something about the wider criminal justice system, is because the criminal justice system is so backed up. Yeah. It's got so many cases that are waiting to be addressed and so many different appeals cases that are going through that frankly one the reason that parliament is going to have to do that adverts to a wider failure which is that frankly if uh, all of these people just had to wait to go through the normal processes they would be waiting for years and years and years so it is an admission of failure in many ways around what is going on in the wider criminal justice system that parliament is having to step in and basically take this unprecedented measure yeah i mean I'm not a fan of the slippery slope argument, as you know. I, I just do think, know. I, I sort of think that it's right to ask the questions, but it's also right occasionally just to say, this has to happen now for all the reasons that yeah, we know. Agreed. And actually, the moment you start pausing again to examine whether this might lead to, you know, another travesty in the future, you've kind of wasted these people's lives for another year or two years. Just going back to, to the Bradshaw line, though, I think you raised such an interesting point John, which is that, yeah, you know, he's the hired gun. He's the heavy. He's the kind of, what did you call him? The, the sort of repossession guy who repo turns guy. up on... The repo yeah, man. turns up on your doorstep. And I do think there's something really dark about this because there is a danger that once again, we finger the people that are the obvious thugs in this story and we let off all the people whose faces aren't known who run the IT companies who've made millions running their technology companies and yes yeah, Stephen Bradshaw was asked have you given enough thought to how you handled this to, to whether you've been part of one of these miscarriages of justice in 2010 you had received those articles relating to problems with Horizon you were aware from this communication that there was a body uh, of cases relating to concerns about the Horizon system. Didn't that cause you pause for thought? Well, the pause for thought is that when, when you would speak to the person being interviewed, you would take that into account. So if, you, if you're informed that there's an issue with the Horizon, you would, look, you would do your best to find out what the issue was. But, but you began it, today by saying that nobody from above had been telling you about bugs, errors or well, defects. I, I don't count Mr Knight as a, uh, somebody from above. He was just equal that he's taken it from the papers. So you had been told by your equals that there were newspaper articles. You had been told by your equals uh, that there was a growing body of cases. But that in itself was not sufficient for you to question the reliability of the Horizon I, system. I, I, because I'm, I'm not technically minded with that. I would expect that to come from the people above. There's just one other aspect to this, which is, of course, slippery slope arguments about, you know, expunging the sentences. I hope that this does not lead people to think that it's over because the compensation scheme for the people affected is so tricky and so difficult and so long winded. And Dan Needle, who we have had on this podcast before, who was the kind of brilliant tax lawyer. He's the people's who, accountant, isn't he's he? He's the people's accountant. He absolutely is. And because he's got such a forensic mind and he kind of, he was the one who kind of found out, you know, 
brought to attention what Nadim Zahawi has had been doing. He's also got involved in this and he's been looking at the forms that the sub postmasters and postmistresses had to fill in. And he said, I was a leading tax lawyer in a firm of top lawyers in this country. I wouldn't have been able to do that yeah. without legal assistance. And yet these people were asked to do this, probably incriminating themselves along the way. And you just realise the scale, the epic scale of what has gone on, uh, how an organisation like the post office has kind of mugged so many of the people and who were trying to And they're still hoping people won't come forward now, right? Yeah. It's a bit like the form that you have to fill in that says, do you not not consent to not have your data yeah. not given to the not in the future? Yeah. You know, by the time you've got to the end of it, you're so exhausted, you have to go and lie down in a dark room. What they hope is that people will take the 75,000, as we discussed yesterday, take the 75,000. If you think you've got a case, then fill in X number of forms, give us X amount of evidence, provide the receipts for this and come back and we'll put this through. And there'll be plenty of people, plenty of people who are already feeling totally underserved by the system who just think I want nothing more to do with it. Well Dan Needle points out one particular case of someone who went through the process this postmaster's uh, conviction was overturned sought uh, recompense compensation and was awarded 15 pounds 75 pence. Yeah that's a pret sandwich a soup and a water. Well there was an exciting moment in the office just before we came downstairs when our excellent producer, Laura, leapt to her feet, grabbed our green marker pen and suddenly started circling February the 15th. Why did she do that, Lewis? She did that because, because the, it's the day after Valentine's Day. Oh, it's not the day after Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, Valentine's uh, Day is very passe, John. Oh, is it? It's by-election day on the 15th. I'm not going to have Whoa. any time for any of that romantic nonsense. <laughs> I'm married now. Don't need to don't need to don't bother need with to all that. And not yeah, all oh, of that. I'm sure your wife will be thrilled to hear I'm that. I'm sure she will. The by-election day for Kingswood, which is Chris Goodmore's seat, resigned last week on Friday, and Wellingborough is going to be on February the fifteenth. So the government, what happens with the by-election is the government moves the writ in Parliament. They decide where the date is going to be, and they've obviously they've opted for a shorter campaign as possible. What five weeks? Four five weeks, uh, in the hope that it will take some time, particularly in Wellingborough for Labour to get all of their organisations sorted. They won't have that much data on Wellingborough a little bit. Uh, and that they can hope they can eke out a win. Most of them think they'll probably lose Kingswood. It's 11,000 majority. Um, obviously not happening in the best circumstances. Chris Sigidmore, who was Energy Minister, resigning on Friday, basically saying the government isn't taking net zero seriously. He's even said today, Skidmore, that he's not even going to back the Conservative Party in that by-election. I mean, he was a Conservative MP until... Friday, and he's saying that he's not going to back the Conservatives anymore. So could completely he just unwelcome. Switch party. I mean, that was what happened yeah, in the olden done. days, yeah. right? To, yeah. If you believe, he could have defected. Yeah, yeah. Right? Could have done. Yeah. yeah but I do. I do to. think we should encourage the government, though, on these short election campaigns for all our sanity. Don't you think? Um, I think four, four weeks is great. Four weeks is great. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, I think longer the better. It's a tiny, there's a tiny length. I mean, Americans do it for about six months, nine months, two but years. But general election. For two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's always an election year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. always. For a general always. election year, well, that's probably going to be, I mean, I, again, I imagine in the spirit of Sunak doing what he's doing all the time at the moment, generally, which is playing it long, I imagine he'll try and do it six, seven week campaign, so, hoping something turns up. The Wellingborough one, I think, is going to be fascinating with this kind yes. of candidate who is, you know, Peter Bone's other half, yep. um, who was the one who was recalled and how the Tories fight that. And Can you imagine, how Helen much Harrison, outside support. Do, you, do you condone what the former Conservative MP, MP did? Yeah. It's not uh, ideal, is it? It's not completely ideal. I mean, in the manner in which he left Parliament and for the reasons that he left Parliament, um, it's not completely ideal to have the partner of that MP as the person. For You've just all alluded to it, Emily. Suddenly everything becomes still about the guy who's just been forced to leave Parliament. And also, are you going to get the current crop of cabinet ministers all beating a path to Wellingborough to be at Helen Har in Har Harrison's side to support her? Well, Sunak did not choose to really formally back her the other day. I mean, he basically said, well, as a matter for the local party, he wasn't exactly rushing out there to say he thought that this was the best candidate selection that there could possibly have been. That said, ultimately, he's the Prime Minister and leader of the party. If he wanted to get a better candidate, he should have bloody well made sure that it had happened. I learnt something from one of our viewers, actually, um, on this, which is that if you have been taken out of your seat by a recall petition, mm. you can still fight that again. Yeah, you can, yeah. So you can go back. I mean, which I think is essentially what Peter Bone has just done. But I think, you know, there is a precedent. Charles Alfitt, Tory MP went to prison. 
His seat was fought and won by Natalie Elphick. We've seen it, I think we we had it in the Welsh seat. Ooh, an independent Welsh seat beginning with B. Blana Gwent. Blana Gwent. There yeah. you go. Blana Gwent. Yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter, what's his name? Oh, now you've, now yeah. you're pushing okay. me. I can't remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Tune in for tomorrow's <laughs> exciting update on that <laughs> no, one. No, this is, oh, this is what they want. Yeah, of course it is. Give the oh. people what they want. I tell you what, <laughs> well, let's turn into a quiz question. What was the name of Peter Law's other half? Why did he resign? And did she win the seat in Blaine Gwent? Answers on a postcard. LA. Actually, don't send us any postcards. We don't want any postcards. Yeah, That's the last the thing that we want. No. no one sends them anymore. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 